I've taken a recent interest into the world of disturbing cinema. And I wanted to know, because usually when I watch something disturbing, it's not on a mainstream streaming service. What are the most disturbing movies on our favorite streaming services? We started with Netflix, talked about Gerald's Game and Hush. If you want to watch that first, you can. But if I'm on the verge of losing you as a new viewer, well, <laughs> let's not waste more time. Of course, right after I tell you that I have a P.O. box and you should send stuff there for the second channel video I'm trying to make. All right, there are two movies that I took from your suggestions. The Ritual and The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which sound like sequels of each other. Listen, Ritual's good. I'm a fan, and I think you'd be a fan. What? Oh no, not that movie. We'll talk about it. I meant today's sponsor, Ritual. And no, this was a thousand percent not planned at all, but as a great man once said, we take those. And pro tip, 10 nutrients supporting a strong foundation for health in two easy to take capsules might help fill some gaps in your diet. I've been taking these, you can tell. This one's full, this one's not. I just started taking these like three days. Ritual is very transparent with everything that goes into these. There's a mint tab in every bottle of these, which I am a fan of, because the stench and taste of lots of multivitamins is not really my vibe, you know? I'm a Gemini. They're vegan friendly, non-GMO, gluten free. There are a bunch of things where you would see and be like, oh yeah, that's good. Also, they just launched a new essential protein range. You boys know I've been out here trying to get the gains, right? So this is right up my alley. Supporting maintenance of lean muscle mass, promoting healthy, active aging for everyone, not just athletes. And Ritual are offering 10% off your first three months by going to ritual.com slash Gigi and using code Mr. GG at checkout. And thank you, Ritual, for sponsoring this video. Let's watch the one with less words first. You can start the intro. Now you can kind of consider this movie to be a by the book sort of deal, but it does somewhat take on its own life. Spoilers, you've been warned. Don't do that thing that I do a lot <laughs> where, where I'm like, oh, I'm never going to watch this movie. But then the person starts explaining the movie and I'm like, man, this movie actually sounds kind of tight. I think I might check it out. But I already know everything. Fuck. Don't do that. So these dude bros are lost in the woods. They are on vacation trying to get to a lodge. Sucks to suck, though, because most of them won't make it. I like this movie. Yes. Yes, I do. I do have some issues and the ending will be discussed. Let me write it down. It begins with Luke and Robert walking in to get some vodka and walking out with one of them dead. That must have been some strong vodka. Unbeknownst to them, the place is getting robbed and Luke's immediate response is to hide and leave Robert in the cold. He gets shook down and after refusing to give up his wedding ring, he gets knocked out. And that is exactly why I tell my friends, hey, when we're out with the boys, put away that wedding ring. One of us killed. He's murdered, and uh, Luke did dick all to stop it. That will come into play again, and again, and again. I'm nuts. They fast forward to the vacation they had all planned out to hike in the mountains of Sweden. Everyone here sucks. Except Phil. I really like Phil. Dom fucks his meniscus because he refuses to watch his step during a hike, which in turn motivates Hutch, the man with the map and compass, to take a shortcut directly through the forest instead of taking the trail around. And Luke let his friend die. Let's go, Phil. <laughs> they quickly run into markings on trees and a dead elk hung up and gutted in a peculiar fashion. What could do that, though? Bear? Do bears do that? I don't know, Dominic, I'm not a fucking bear expert. <laughs> Luke even making the observation that it's a fresh kill. Onward we go. It begins to obnoxiously storm and they find a random house that has a weird creation upstairs. Phil even making the observation that it's witchcraft. Nighty night, fellas. So they all have terrible nightmares. Phil even wakes up naked praying to demon Beowulf Hay. They hurry out to all these symbols carved in the trees, openly referred to in the group as a warning. It's a warning. Which makes a lot of sense. I think we all got that vibe. Hmm. 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 What to do? Luke says, hey, let's just turn back and we'll take the long way around. Which, yes, I said it in a stupid voice, but that's the most logical decision to make from here. Their response? Ugh, but then that adds another day to the trip. Even though we have the necessary equipment to do so, can we just stop being a bunch of fat pussies? Dom spots out an apparent path and urges the team to follow it. He doesn't really urge him, he just kind of starts going, so it's not really open to debate, and then Phil follows. 
Why, Phil? His reasoning is that all paths lead to civilization. And by that logic, they also lead to this demon nightmare house. Now, so far, I'm obviously making this movie sound a certain type of way, right? But what I do enjoy up until this point is that the movie looks pretty high tier all around. It's what a dick wild like me says when I know nothing about cinematography. It looks nice. I liked it. And I think the actors are solid. They seem to have a good chemistry, and I've even enjoyed a handful of their jokes. Maybe I just like their accent. I don't know yet. But yes, they do have a bad knack of having terrible judgment. They also discredit each other's conspiracies non-stop, even after it's glaringly apparent that something's wrong. So now at this point in the movie, here's the deal. Dom's knee is getting worse. He won't make it much further. Phil brought the wrong pair of shoes to the hiking trip that they had six months to plan. So he's hurting pretty bad too. Hutch goes over to Luke, gives him half of his protein bar when he had already given the other half to Dom, and then tells him, hey, I'm gonna help you get prepped in the morning. You go to civilization solo and bring back help. These two will only slow you down. You're the most healthy here. I'll stay back with them. Essentially, sacrificing himself to bank on Luke, or at the very least, allow Luke a chance at life. It's just, you know, just wow. Beautiful. Tears in my ass. By the way, Luke is still a massive piece of shit. Cause he still has all these protein bars in his bag. Tells no one and still had the gall to take hutches. And that's Luke's thing because he keeps hallucinating that moment during the robbery because he shouldn't forget that he sucks. Luckily, Hutch's plan goes down the shitter, but unfortunately, that's because our unknown villain takes Hutch and props him up just like Bullwinkle. And since they chased down Hutch, they lost where they set up their tents. Now you just can't leave. The best they can do is to grave rob Hutch for his compass and knife. And Dom is still arguing at this point on whether or not to feed into the fact that there is something much more malicious out there, which just rattles my sack because Luke and Phil discuss their nightmarish possessions in the house. And Dom doesn't say what he experienced. He just tries to discredit them because he's in denial and suckish. He sucks. Luke sucks. Dom and Luke suck. Team Phil. Luke is finally able to see the edge of the forest, along with some fires lit along the way. But yeah, three's a crowd, so the movie makes the stupidest call possible and murders Phil. And although I get why they chose Phil, especially because by the end of it, they had just made him like a completely hollow character. And although nobody here wants to die, Luke does run away after seeing Phil get snatched up, completely ignoring the survival of Dom. But he does get bonked by a tree to stop him. Has another robbery flashback, reminding like, hey, you suck. <laughs> I just realized that their friend Rob got robbed. Faceless murder is so ironic. And he finds Dom. Now, the enemy has not been shown. There's, there's been a little peek or two, but nothing solidified. And I honestly didn't think they were going to show us. I thought this was going to be like a Blair Witch situation. But just like losing in Deal or No Deal, that is not the case. They get chased down by the monster. They run into a cabin and obviously didn't knock. So they end up chained up by some medieval hillbillies. And I like that this is the direction they went because another quick swoop in the woods would have done nothing for me. I also like the score. Just want to throw that out there. So now we're left with the two worst shitheads chained up. They beat the shit out of Dom to prep him for sacrifice. I don't know why that's the thing, but they do it. They try to explain it. It doesn't make sense. Why'd you hurt him? I don't get you need to subdue him. He was subdued. He literally has one leg. And Dom finally admits his nightmare was being grabbed by the monster thing, but that he saw his wife also. And Dom, realizing the end is near, tells Luke to get the fuck out and burn this place down while he does. And Luke tries to comfort him, telling him, no, we're getting out. Work it now. You and me. Us. Together. So they tie up Dom for sacrifice and Jumanji's on his way. Luke breaks his fucking thumb to escape the rope, but he's only able to get one hand out. Dom hallucinates his wife and thinks, oh fuck. What? Right, not do the dishes? Oh, thank God, it's just a Yu-Gi-Oh card. So this thing, these people, is a god. How they came to that conclusion? I'm not sure, I guess they just took him at face value. This haunted Manfred approached the Hills Have Eyes crew and let them know, hey, I'm a god. And I'm sure there were detractors that were most likely promptly hung up as decor. I just told you who I thought I was, a god. He apparently grants them very long lives with no pain, no death. That's what this Randall who speaks English tells him. Luke manages to escape before his ritual and walks into a room where he had been hearing these wheezy chants. So he walks in, and silence. But he sees a meeting type setting of these withered monsters and sees them breathing and they begin to yell. <laughs> They're still alive. This must be the OGs of the crowd. So Luke just gently moves the torch over and sets them on fire, fulfilling Dom's request, which is nice. And then he tries to move out. 
Oh no! Spooky granny. My plans have been foiled. What do I do? Against a 5 foot 4, 120 year old woman that's weaponless. Man, that's such a good scene. <laughs> I love when we don't pussyfoot around. Any other movie, she would yell for somebody else and then they would come in with reinforcements. This guy would try to run away. Not here. Fight or flight. I may not have the nicest right jab in the world, but I will fucking lay out the elderly for freedom. Luke goes to grab a gun because they've collected so much equipment from past scragglers and he only finds two bullets. Someone's skull returns and he's pissed because the feng shui is all off. So he starts taking this chick as a sacrifice. Luke runs into another guy who tries reasoning with him in his dingo bingo language. Fuck off Spock. And this is where the ending starts to mess with me. So Luke's pretty much away. He's primed to run away and escape the forest. The beast is occupied with murdering the rando chick, who did try to comfort Luke at one point, kind of. No more pain. No more death. And I'm guessing that means this is supposed to be his redemption moment? To save this girl even though he can clearly save himself? But that's a lie. And doesn't make any sense because she's already been destroyed. The monster dropped her off a little earlier and her eyes were gouged. She seemed dead already. I have no reason to believe that that chick is alive. So if that's the case, this is the worst time for him to care. Doesn't matter. But he loads up a shot and takes aim. And if the thing is, oh, I'm going to kill this thing so it doesn't terrorize anyone else anymore. That's a bowl of baloney because there's no way Luke is dumb enough to believe this thing's going down with one rifle shot. A fucking moose isn't guaranteed to go down with one rifle shot. This is a god. <laughs> Luke continues to hallucinate the robbery and the mammoth demon catches up to him. And instead of killing him, appears to just force him to bow before him. And for a while he does, but then reaches for a nearby axe, stabs him, and runs out the forest. The woolly prophet runs after him, but pauses before leaving the forest as well. And then they have a yelling match, which is goofy, usually always. And I'm taking all that as this is him overcoming his demon, right? Like now he has power over it. Ah! He won't let it hunt him. So he didn't want to leave the forest without conquering that demon first. That's why he shot. And it's a bit of a stretch, especially because he didn't exactly become good Samaritan of the year at any point during this movie. I mean, he barely tried being decent at like the end of the movie. The lesson learned here is shit. I know he may have said some nice things, but talk is cheap. Like him telling Dom, no, it's going to be you and me. No, we're getting out. Like, that's just what you say in that situation. Even though you know this person, like, yeah, they're probably gonna fucking die. Hey, no, 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 come on. Get your head in the game. <laughs> like, that's just what you do. I think he's still a shitty person. Honestly, that's the worst part about the movie. It is a fun movie to put on when your, like, family comes over. I think anybody can enjoy this movie, or at least be engaged enough to then be disappointed by the ending. But with all of that... Disturbing? No. Nah, mm -mm. I don't even think I can classify it as that. I don't even think I can put it in that realm. It's just a fun horror survival movie. I didn't really feel some type of way watching it or after watching it. I was just like, oh, that was cool. Like there's people in my life that cannot do disturbing at all. I would have zero problem showing them this movie. So a fun watch, but in terms of Netflix's most disturbing, this movie will not be attending. So now to move on to something that will. That was a thing. Yeah. You guys seen this? You heard about this? So much anxiety. Why do they do that to you? It's kind of messed up. These were both blind watches. So for the first half of this movie, I was just sat there with my thumb up my ass, my feet tapping, like, where the fuck are you going with this? This movie was a great experience. And the reason why I say it like that is because I wasn't exactly crazy about my second watch of this movie. And there could be a lot of different factors there, but I think it was because I was just no longer in the dark. It was a bit more difficult to immerse myself in the anxiety of it all because I know where we end up. And I think a lot of the oof with this movie is the nail biting to see how it progresses and how it ends. So with that, spoilers, it matters more here. Because honestly, I could probably put on the ritual in the background and it'd be fine. So everyone in this movie is weird. I don't want to say subdued. Uh, no one shows any emotion. People rarely adjust their pitch or their cadence. So there's a lot of work going on here. The actors do an incredible job. Nicole Kidman, I've heard her name, never really knew what she did. I think she was married to Bruce Willis at one point. 
No. She does a great job in this movie. She's fucking great. So all of that with the slow burn of events just makes those scenes with raw motion that much more powerful. So we are introduced to Steven, the father of your typical atypical suburban family, his wife Anna, and his two kids, Bob and Kim. P.S. His wife's an ophthalmologist? Has to do with eyes. It's important for a joke later. And then there's the oddball of the oddballs, Martin. And it isn't until much later in the movie that we're told who Martin even is. You just see Steven randomly hanging out with this kid with clear mental problems nearly every day without telling anybody. And seeing that, you can imagine where my innocent mind went to. They fucking they're not martin is the son of steven's one of steven's old patients because he's a surgeon and steven also has quasi necrophilia because when he gets it on with anna she looks over like general anesthetic general anesthetic and then proceeds to pretend to be lifeless on the bed so he can be aroused like she's asking him if he wants like a small or large fries general anesthetic also apparently the correct term is somnophilia a paraphilia in which an individual becomes sexually aroused by someone who is unconscious hmm I mark this video as educational now? Fucking quadruple my RPM. I'm gonna be skipping a lot of the buildup. So if by the end of it, you're like, ah, he gassed up this movie. No, it's cause you didn't watch it. Steven introduces Martin to his family and he gets close with Steven's daughter. And oddly enough, Martin's mom wants to bang Steven. Even Steven, even Steven wants them to hook up because he wants Steven as a dad because his dad died on the operating table with Steven as the surgeon. So after a fiasco with Martin's mom, Steven starts distancing himself from Martin. This is obviously an issue because they would hang out often and Martin basically stalks Steven. One beautiful sunny day, Bob can't get out of bed. I can't get up. Oh boo hoo, welcome to life you little turd, get up. My legs, they're numb. I can't move them. Can't feel my legs. Get up, you sound like your mother. <laughs> hey yo, right? Seriously though, you're gonna be late. So Bob ends up paralyzed and doctors, Steven and all his coworkers, can't figure out why. And they try to brush it off as stress. That's when Martin catches up with Steven and drops a bombshell. Bob is going to die. It will begin with paralysis, then refusal to eat, then his eyes will bleed, and from there it will only be a matter of hours. And Steven's daughter and Steven's wife will follow suit. Unless Steven kills one of them first. Family member? or family member, because Martin blames Steven for the death of his father. He shouldn't have died on that operating table. Steven messed up. So now Steven must pay the ultimate sacrifice or face a fate even worse. Now, rightfully so, Steven has no reason to take Martin seriously. That's why security boots Martin with the swiftness. Yeah, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, go paint. Doesn't that guy look like a painter? But he doesn't think he's that crazy because shortly after he's trying to shove a donut in Bob's mouth since he hasn't eaten. He so desperately wants to write off Martin as a whack job. And why is his child named Bob? Does he look like a Bob? At some point, Martin also tells Kim what the deal is. She's obviously not a fan, so she tries to subtly bribe Martin by just stripping down and offering her body, telling him she loves him very much. Martin doesn't give a fuck. He even says, quote, don't be a drag. I thought you understood. And then he leaves shortly after. Fucking menace. Listen, all of you are gonna die a slow, painful death, or your father's gonna be forced to murder one of you. So with that time, are you crying? Why are you crying? See, this is why I can't tell you anything. Steven's slowly starting to lose it because tests continue to be ran and there's no evidence of anything for Bob's issues. So in a big group of people, Anna's like, I think it's psychosomatic. Steven's like, oh, I didn't realize Bob was having trouble seeing. Oh, he's not? And shut the fuck up, Anna. Oh, what do you see now? I'm exaggerating, but he straight up just shits on her. Because I think he looks at it as, if everyone's in agreement that it's psychosomatic, then that's kind of means Martin's telling the truth. This movie's funny, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. There's random bouts of comedy, but the tone never changes. This next scene is kind of what I mean. Steven's desperate for this to be something else, so he just says, Bob, walk. He's literally dipping him to the ground like an action figure to make his, like, knees pop. <laughs> he tries to get Bob to fess up that this is an act. Even threatens him, but nothing. Can I just say that I love, love how they get Kim to move into paralysis? She's singing Carol of the Bells in a choir, a very intense sounding song that's actually about getting rid of all the bad vibes and just being happy. Down the chimney she goes, and no cookies and milk here because now she refuses to eat as well. It is at this point that Steven goes straight to Martin's house and demands entry. He is ignored. And this is where my man's at, mentally, right about now. Open the door, I will smash it down and I will fuck you and your mother! 
And with that, he tells Anna what Martin said, and Anna can't help but ask if he was drinking that day of the surgery. Was it a mistake, or were you careless? Does Martin actually have reason to want some sort of vengeance against you? Speaking of Martin, my guy's still talking to Kim. She still likes him too. So he calls her while she's in the hospital bed and just taunts the family because Martin tells her to go to the window because he's outside and she now miraculously can, showing how easily this can all be fixed. Bob also gets jealous seeing this, and he's like, all right, my time to stand now. Then Kim's legs give out right on cue. Also, Steven's still in denial about the plot, because if he validates Martin's threat, he validates Martin's accusation. So Anna talks to people to do some snooping of her own, even doing some real side-eye shit to get the truth of what happened with Martin's father. Because Steven's high key a piece of shit. The children are allowed to return home, but they need feeding tubes and s still can't walk. Meanwhile, Steven's in La La Land acting like everything's okay now that they're home. But Anna is broken and taking aim at Steven. He fucking loses it in response and it's great comedy. I don't suppose you've got any pubes I can have by any chance. In fact, it's so funny that Steven wanted, wanted a buddy to share the laughter with. Uh, so he ties up Martin in the basement and beats the dog shit out of him. Knock, knock. Knockout! But he knows that won't actually do anything, so now that everyone gets the game and knows what's happening, let the strats begin. Bob tries impressing his father and trying to be the perfect son, army crawling to the other room to do it, saying, hey dad, finally cut my hair like you wanted me to. <laughs> hey, by the way, dad, I want to grow up to be a surgeon just like you. Yeah, I know I said I wanted to be an ophthalmologist before. Fuck that. That's not fun at all. What a stupid career, right? Pound it. Kim ignores her dad and just says, well, I'm going to go to the source. Hey, Martin, let's run away and let's be with each other. Uh, just fix my legs, please. Martin, fix my legs. Nope. Anna tries giving Steven that good unconscious nookie and even just straight up tells him, logically, we should kill one of the kids. We can make more. And Steven goes as far as to talk to the school's principal, asking who's better academically and less of a troublemaker. And as fun as that all is, it doesn't matter because Bob's eyes begin to bleed. So at the end of it, Steven gathers all of them in the living room, each in a different portion of the room, duct taped with a bag over their head. Steven blinds himself as well, loads up his rifle, and I don't play favorites. This is how it ends. He whiffs two shots, amateur. And on the third shot he hits, but I'm not gonna tell you who he hit. So was this movie disturbing? Yes, were you not listening? The pacing, the score, the lack of emotion and reaction to complete turmoil, the ending, I love it. It definitely beats out the ritual, but against my first video, Hush and Gerald's Game, oh, it beats out Hush pretty easily. And it beats out Gerald's Game too. So as of now, after watching a whopping four titles, The Killing of a Sacred Deer is the most disturbing movie on Netflix. And these two suggestions came from uh, the comment section of my last video in the series. So if you think you have a worthy contender on Netflix, drop it below. And we'll see if this movie can be dethroned. He shot Bob, okay? He shot Bob. And it's really sad and bleak because Kim was willing to die. She was down. She was like, shoot me, dad. I'll do it for you guys. And Anna, in my eyes, has no reason to like or stay with Steven past this point. My little dude was probably like the number one. I don't want to go out like that. By the way, he was the last one to get the bag over his head. And as Steven moves towards him, he's the only one that does anything in response. He leans back and shakes his head. Sure, you can just take that as fear, but I took it as his last plea. Like, please, dad, not me, not me. They're both covered, they'll never know didn't matter. Now it's time for a really happy outro. If you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like. Here is your second reminder to please leave a like. Please subscribe because I have more content coming your way. Shout out to my beautiful, lovely patrons for always supporting the boy. Appreciate you guys very much. I have a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 7147, uh, Grays Lake, Illinois, 60030, I think. Send shit to it. I would love to make a second channel video with some of the stuff you guys send over. Subscribe to the second channel, been dropping stuff on there. Subscribe to the third channel, been dropping stuff on there. And as always, I am Mr. Gigi, and I am out. <laughs>